Um, bueno, bienvenidos a Uruguay, a la Federación de Uruguay. Welcome to Uruguay. Está súper está super caliente. Es hot, it's a hot country. Es really hot right now. Like the continent, I would say. Um, welcome to this workshop from Mayor Andrade. In, um, interrupted by us on the Steam. Uh, And uh, for me, it's a pleasure to have Marian here. I have been working with her for 10 years uh, as a PhD student and as a postdoc. Um, and I love this work that she, this, that she has been done in this particular topic, in which she has been winning a lot of awards at the university. Uh, and I mean, like, you know, dedicated a lot of her time in trying to open uh, ideas, and in my case, to open my mind about some preconcepts that I have in my life, and I think that thanks to her, I can see the work that it's really perspective right now. So I hope you guys will enjoy this workshop, and any question you have, we can do it in Spanish or in English, um, and enjoy it because you guys are amazing. Okay? Anita? Yes. Good morning. Um, you can ask your questions in uh, English or Spanish only because Luciana and others will help me. I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> I have machine translated my slides as much as possible. If you want to laugh because they're hilarious, that's fine. <laughs> We might need to break the tension at some point. <laughs> um, and so today what I'm going to do is talk to you about uh, some of the work I do in addition to my research on unconscious bias and trying to understand why certain patterns we see in research in the academy um, seem to be persistent. So uh, when I was an undergraduate in Vancouver, I was the only black student out of 400 in my class. That was true all the way until I graduated. As a master's student, I was one of three in my department who were black. And then as a PhD student, one of two. As faculty, the only one at the entire University of Toronto who was a black woman in fundamental research. And when I asked people why that was the case for more than 20 years, I've been a faculty member since 2000, uh, they said, well, black people just aren't interested in this kind of research. When you ask them why you see an underrepresentation of women, people say, well, women want to have babies, and that makes it hard to do research. And these are really not good explanations, because uh, we know from the Human Genome Project, I'm going to get into data in a minute, the Human Genome Project tells us, for example, that what we call races are a fabrication of human societies. Our genomes actually overlap such that someone in the audience listening to me who identifies as white is as likely to share genes with me, variants, as someone who identifies as black. So that means the things that are filtering people out are not based in our biology. They're based in the social systems that we work through. And so that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. And I, I should say to start, I am mixed race, even though I appear uh, black. My last name is Portuguese, actually, Andrade. Um, and I, we have heritage from that side of um, our family. My husband is white. My children are mixed race. This is not a pointing fingers conversation. This is me realizing quite late in my career, I think, that there were things in the social sciences in which there are deep experimental literature that we weren't aware of in science, I think, for the most part, but that could explain some of these patterns. Now, periodically, I'll be saying speed check, speed check, okay. Mm. Mm, okay. Uh, my students tell me that when I get excited or interested, I talk fast. I'm going to try not to do that. I appreciate that most people in this room are bilingual or trilingual. I am not. Okay, so there will be two participation tools. You're always welcome to ask a question or speak in a conversation, but sometimes people, at least initially, want to have an anonymous way of contributing. So there's these two tools. Um, you have a piece of paper in front of you for the QR code. Uh, in some cases, I will have an anonymous poll that lets us see what people in the, in the room think altogether. Sometimes there will be a shared notepad, so if you have a digital device, you can type in um, your thoughts there. And those will be on the slide when we have time to do that. So, we're together for a long time. <laughs> uh, this morning, first I'm going to start by giving you a talk to set the context. Uh, about 45 minutes or so, I've got my timer going. Um, and then we'll have time for question and answer, have a bit of a break. Uh, 
And then I'm going to talk about ways to interrupt some of the patterns that, um, that I've been discussing in the first piece. And then we're going to go through some scenarios, some video scenarios, and sort of dissect what's happening and how we might think about changing things in our context. Another break. Um, and then ideas for lasting change, uh, by which I mean things that are not just individuals choosing to act in a different way, but how do we change things structurally, our processes, our policies, to make sure these things don't happen. Um, and then we'll have some time for open discussion. What do you, uh, are you aware of in your own context that you might like to change? And we can brainstorm about how we might be able to do that based on the literature. So I'd like to start with definitions. Um, and so the first one is equity, which um, there's various ways of describing this. Intuitively, people sort of know that equity is about fair and respectful treatment of all people. But it's more than that. It's actually acknowledging that for some people, their identity leads to barriers to what they want to do in life, to their success. Not how hard they try, not how much they learn, not their talent, not their innovation, but rather just their identity and how society treats them as a result. So understanding those different kinds of barriers and removing them is required to have an equitable approach to whatever you're doing. I'd like to have this cartoon, which some of you may have seen, um, a version of. And so the idea here is that when you think about where we are currently in terms of inequality in society, some people, let's say we're trying to watch this game, it should have been soccer, but it's baseball. An American made yeah. uh, uh, The person on the right starts out in a hole. There are various things about the way that they move through the world that puts them at a disadvantage. The person in the middle, a little bit of a hill, so not too bad, they can see over the fence. The person on the left, a big advantage, and they can see over the fence quite easily. Now, if we want to readjust this, if we want to actually change things so that there are equitable availability of viewing the game, if we give everybody the same advantage or program, then we just end up with the same inequality. Sure, everyone can now see the game, if that's your goal, okay. But really, ideally, our goal is that everyone has the same opportunities in life at the same level with the same amount of effort. And to do that, you need to think about differential treatment. And that's why we talk about equity being different from equality. It's not about equal treatment. It's about acknowledging that that is a situation. I'll try to demonstrate to you that that's the case using data. If that is a situation, then we can't just ignore it on this side, right? Otherwise, we are going to perpetuate that disadvantage. And so equal outcomes are what we after. We want everyone to be on the same level of the outcome. And by the same level, I don't mean opportunities that you don't earn. I mean the same opportunity with the same amount of effort and talent to get what you're looking for in life. And so equal outcomes require differential treatment. And that's something that's hard for people to understand sometimes because it feels like you're being unfair. You're only being unfair if you ignore that one person is in the hole to begin with. Diversity, uh, so at home we talk about equity, diversity, inclusion. Diversity for a lot of people, or in the old days at least, this is the goal, right? What you want to see is that the representation in our organizations, from entry level right in through leadership, is representative of the populations we live in. That's a long-term goal, right? So if you walk along the streets in your city, you hope that the people you pass on the street, the distribution of identities, are represented in your organization. And so that's the ideal on the left here. So we're going to talk, we're going to talk mostly about gender. Most of the things I'm talking about will apply to race as well. And so here you see an organization that's 50-50 all the way along. You draw from the available talent. Clearly there's competition to get into the leadership. You have to be talented. But you do expect, on average, that that representation should be similar all the way along. But in reality, this is what we have in most organizations. And in fact, if you look at the data, and I'm, so I now give, um, I'm a consultant for uh, various sectors. So I've given talks for banks, for uh, accounting groups, for uh, professional societies. And every group says, well, you know, we're kind of unique. I'm like, you're not unique, because I pull up your data, and it looks exactly like that. Um, and that is that there is a loss of women or people of color as you move along. And there are particular steps you can identify where there's a big loss. And that's typically when you move into leadership or management or middle management. Inclusion um, is kind of a step beyond that. So it's not just that people are represented in the organization at all levels, but they are um, respected and they know that their ideas will be treated fairly and with an open mind. 
without regard to their identity when they bring them to the table. So recognition of respect for and welcome, welcoming of individual differences. Everyone is confident that their ideas will be treated fairly. You feel like you can be yourself at work. You're not altering your behavior or anything about your identity when you are engaging at work. So some people call this having a seat at the table. Um, you're, you're not just sort of being kept in the background and used to tally up the numbers so to show that you have diversity. So I do like to ask people this question right at the start of the session. Uh, this is an anonymous poll, so no one will know what you answer. www.menta.com, punch in the code or the sheet in front of you, you can use a QR code. And the question is, what is your current level of understanding of diversity and inclusion issues? And this is just to help us see where we are in the room. You could say low, I'm here to learn. Moderate, I understand, but I'm not comfortable explaining to others. High, I understand and I can explain to others. Or very high, I can explain to others and suggest actions for change, and I just remember I have to do this. <laughs> so thank you for the people who said they could access the program. And we will see this coming in in real time once you start answering. But I should actually hide it, otherwise I influence your responses. <laughs> so um, I ask this question at every session I give. I've given, I don't know how many workshops, maybe 40 in the last few years. And so I see a good distribution from different groups. So what's your current level of understanding of diversity and inclusion issues? Let's see if I can go back yet. 13, okay, 13 responses. So 38% said hi. I understand I can explain to others. 56 about, moderate. I can basically understand it, but I'm not comfortable talking about it. Um, and then a little slice of the pie is very high and knows about actions. Um, and a slice of the pie is slightly low, they're here to learn. This is kind of representative of what I see no matter where I go. I've given these talks in various places through Canada and the United States. A lot of people, especially since 2020, have started to engage with these issues and know a bit about it that aren't necessarily comfortable talking about it. A lot of people are still just starting to learn, and that's fine too. And I, what I like to do is to emphasize, when I do these sessions, people who say they're low will often ask questions with fresh eyes that can push other people up in their understanding. It's also important when you want to make change to understand the viewpoint of people who are just starting to learn and what it is that needs to be shared or communicated or discussed um, to allow them to move to the next level if they're interested in doing that. So this is, a, this is a good distribution, and like I said, it's, it's representative of what I see, so thank you for responding to that. So the point here is, that, oh, I forgot to bring the shirt. <laughs> the point here is that equity and inclusion is a path. It's not a one-step thing. You will be moving through your life. This is my son, <laughs> many years ago, and I actually brought that jersey. I was going to give it away to the first person who asked a question, but it's back in my hotel room, in my room, so I'll bring it to the conference. Um, when I did a little bit of a practice with Luciana and my grad students, they were just like, why is it messy? Like, what? Like, they didn't read anything on that side of the slide, so I, you know, I apologize. Anyway, so these, this is my family walking a path. And the idea is that once you see that distribution, and like I said, every group I talk to has that distribution, you should recognize that when you engage with people, they're all going to be in different places. It's not helpful to come into these conversations at very high and use jargon and you know try to force them into where you are you have to meet people where they are and have open conversations if you actually want to make change um, and so change is challenging it's not easy none of it's easy often takes more time putting spanish in all these slides took some time <laughs> um, and change requires sustained effort so it's not one and done um, which i think sometimes our administrators check a box and think they're done if you let it slide your numbers will slide your inclusion will slide as well Oh, thank you. Fantastic. Okay, so we're going to talk about data and patterns first, and then go through some of the other things I, I mentioned uh, at the beginning. Um, so let's look at representation, uh, the cumulative effects of bias and case studies, and then we'll have a Q&A. So representation, as I said, the goal for diversity, that's kind of the bottom bar, is just to see whether the people in our organizations reflect pool. And the pool could be the people on the street, but whenever I talk about the pool being the people walking the streets of the city, people say, well, it's a pathway problem, it's they're in bad schools, they're not well prepared, etc., etc." So I'm going to jump over that question and just talk about what we see within our organizations. 
And what you see in our organizations is, regardless of how much there's underrepresentation at the entry level, whatever you have at the entry level, people from marginalized groups, women, people of color, gender minorities, um, et cetera, they're lost as you move through the organization. So we're no longer talking about the problem with bringing people in. We're saying there's a problem in the organizations that are exacerbating whatever, that are making worse whatever you have at that bottom level. Um, and the gaps increase with rank. So um, because I know people are from all different places, I pulled these data from uh, the UN on men and women. Um, and this is a global estimate in STEM um, from data in 2017. Sorry for the hissing. Um, and so what you can see is uh, women and men, and this is what they call the scissors plot, which means we start out actually now in most places, um, at least uh, in uh, North America and South America, with the proportion of women at undergraduate level actually a little bit higher than men. But as you move through bachelor's, master's, PhD, and into researchers, the number of women plummets. And so this is the reality in, in most countries that I think that most of you are from. I'm going to show you some data from Canada, uh, just because I know what sort of things we tried to do there, and I can, we can talk about that as possibly being instructive. And basically, the graph show you for women, what I'll call racialized people, so people of color, uh, however that's defined in, in, here, uh, in your country, and then people with disabilities, which in Canada are three of the, uh, what we call employment equity groups. So for women, if you start on the far left of the red, um, this is the proportion of women in Canada who are undergraduates, graduate students, PhD holders, faculty, and then leaders in the academy. What you can see for women is that there's a big drop of PhD. But in Canada now, the proportion who are in the faculty is actually equivalent to the proportion of PhD, and leaders are actually enriched for women. There's more women in the leadership than um, the proportion of PhDs. This is after decades and decades of equity programs. If I'd shown you this a few years ago, it would look exactly like a graph of racialized people, which is women dropped off to nothing. I'll also say this is across all fields. So this is not STEM. STEM doesn't look like this. STEM looks a lot more like the one for racialized people, like you saw in the last graph. For racialized people, though, it's, it's a constant drop off. For people with disabilities, the data are spotty. But again, there's places where you see big drops in representation. Is that real? As in the proportion of people with disabilities have gone down? Or are they afraid to disclose that they have a disability? Either of those is problematic, right? So there's problems with this uh, as well. So the proportion of women has increased significantly in the decades, the last few decades in Canada because of active targets and equity programs that incentivize the universities to hire them. If you look at all the data, and I'm not going to show you all of it again, everyone's from a different place, um, but insights from what we see in the data in Canada and the US is that in the absence of active measures and targets, you don't see change. Or change is so incrementally slow that it'll be hundreds of years before we get anywhere close to equity in terms of representation. And so the types of active programs, like I said, are incentivizing, um, including targets. And a target is not a quota. A target isn't, you have to hire this number of women. A target is, our goal is to increase the proportion of women by this date, by this amount. And you look at your data every year to ask how you're doing and figure out whether you need to reach out to more applicants, figure out whether there's something about your recruitment process that is filtering out women, figure out whether women are dropping out when they have children. 50% of us are able to have children. So our employment has to allow for that. And if we're losing women at that stage, there's something wrong with the structure. So um, what we see in Canada and the US is that even now with those programs, things are getting better, but the researchers, faculty, and leaders don't reflect national po populations, undergraduate populations, or even the pool of available talent, which is the previous stage before you get to the researcher stage. But we also see that change is possible, um, but policy on its own doesn't need to change. And so I didn't show you the policy because it's super boring. <laughs> but there's been policy and also law in place about employment equity for quite a long time in Canada and the US. Lots of laws of that kind here. I looked at them. Um, but that alone isn't enough. Now, I want to flag, again, at the beginning I said when I used to ask people uh, what the issue is, I'd be told black people just aren't interested. That's why we see that pattern of representation. I hear the same thing about women. 
I find it bizarre because there is no other place where a scientist would look at a correlation and tell you that it's causation. But for some reason with equity, that's what you get. So when you say to people, you know, what's going on with this pattern of representation, you do get this logical fallacy all the time. People of fill in the blank are just not as qualified, or they're just not as capable, or they're just not as interested. So I'm just going to flag this as a concern because you will hear this in response when you ask people about these issues. Um, and it really is the same as doing this in your research. Okay, so why should we care about equity and inclusion? Um, in the old days, I never had this slide. <laughs> because to me, it's just human rights. And uh, that's an important enough justification. But I understand that, that you need more than that, especially, and again, Usually everyone in the room is sort of interested in these issues, and so I don't need this slide for you, but you may need some of these points to make to other people if you're trying to convince them to make change. So human rights and the law in many places, it does make for a more attractive workplace. Even people in the statistically dominant group in our context, uh, white men, don't always fit the stereotype. And those people are at a disadvantage or may also feel like they can't bring themselves to work, right? So this does advantage, uh, it's an advantage for everyone. If you teach, if you have graduate students, it also increases student success to have a diverse role models. Particularly for women, we see that, right? If women, I've had women come up to me and go, you have kids? That's why my kids in the slides right at the beginning, right? Because some women feel that they can't have children and have a career of this type. So there's this range of mentors and role models that are necessary. And then there's a kind of selfish thing, the academic business case. There is accumulating very strong evidence that gender diverse, culturally diverse, racially diverse teams actually produce more innovative science, are more likely to have intuitive leaps into new areas or novel explanations. Because they're challenging each other in different ways, they come from different perspectives. And this is a great example of that, I think. This is an example from Google. Um, and so why consider equity inclusion? There was a time when you couldn't get from your smartphone um, onto YouTube. There was no programs. It was a really hard thing to do. I know most of you are too young to remember that. Um, but Google at some point did create a program that let you do that, right? Take your video and upload it to YouTube seamlessly. And they rolled it out worldwide. And what they found was that 5 to 10% of the videos were upside down. Because if you're right-handed, but if you're left-handed, almost no lefties on the development team. And the result was they overlooked this huge piece of the human population and how they would interact with the program. So that alone, I think, is an easy analogy for the work that we're doing in science. And that was expensive, right? They had to pull it back and redevelop the whole program. It works now. OK, so in the old days, when you talked about problems of people kind of being filtered out of the system or not being treated fairly or assessed fairly, Oh, and I should see, I see people writing. I'm happy to share the slides afterwards. I took off most of the references because I had to fit in both Spanish and English, um, but I can share those as well. So um, when we talked about biases in the system, people you know, recognized that meant people were being differentially evaluated based on their identity in some way that was unfair. But people didn't think that was the issue because everyone thought about bias as something that was explicit or conscious, right? It's the evil person in the background going like, hey, keep those people out, right? Or explicitly sexist or racist or whatever. Um, and so I think for that reason, this wasn't considered a, a big part of the problem. And so, for example, you'll see a lot of programs that are priming the pump or bringing people into the institution, like I said. The problem is the influx, completely ignoring the loss in the institution, which is a big part of the problem as well. And so, in more recent times, people have started thinking about the ways in which we evaluate each other that could be leading to the loss of people in the pipeline who are already in our institutions. Also entry, but that's another story. Um, and so these uh, are related to the way that we think as human beings. Um, and there's a concept in social psychology called schema. Basically, as humans, we think in categorical ways, using very little information to make quick decisions most of the time. It's sunny outside, what month is it, March? It's March. <laughs> if it was sunny in February and I was in Toronto, I'd put on a parka before I go outside, a big heavy jacket, without even thinking twice. I don't measure the air temperature. I don't think about you know, heat loss from my skin. If I think, oh, you know, you put one of you in Uruguay in February, you see it's sunny outside, you're putting on a tank top or whatever, right? 
You take information from the past, a little bit of information from the present, and make a quick decision. You're not actually evaluating today, right? Other than the sun, you're not evaluating the current temperature. You're painting on your experience in the past onto the current context. So that's all good when it comes to the weather, but we do that with people as well. So a few visible characteristics which do not correlate with my genome, otherwise, right? This is like melanin, not my genome. Um, this causes you to put people in a mental bucket or category. And what's in that bucket are stereotypes, are the way that you see people of color represented in the media, the way that you see women represented in the media, right? Once you've identified them in a particular group. And just like the weather, our experiences socially then paint on to our current context, which is a person we're dealing with now who's not related to the past. And it actually filters how we interpret their behavior because we have expectations based on the past. And this is all happening subconsciously. We don't know what's happening. So these schema are categorical organizations of information, things or people and the relationships among them. And they arise from these experiences in our past. So let me do a speed check, is that okay? I'm not asking you English speakers, by the way. <laughs> you people who grew up in English speaking. But anyway, thank you for that anyway. Uh, okay, so we have these schema, and that's what has given rise to this whole field of study of unconscious or implicit bias. So if we're categorically um, uh, sorting people based on very little information, again, even if you don't know that you're doing this, you don't perceive that you're doing this, it can lead to these filters on our perception or unconscious bias. The expressions are unintentional and automatic. They can often be contrary to your conscious experience of trying to act in an equitable way. The really hard part about this, I think, that I show people, and I'll show you the data in a minute and what, why we think this is happening, is that as a good person, you don't want to think you have a bias. And if you do have a bias that's unconscious, you are just feeling like you're making a good decision, right? Which is what we're all trying to do. So I'm gonna show you the data that says that if you are not conscious of making yourself conscious of these things, you will actually be making bad decisions. And that's something that's hard to accept, especially for a scientist. So here's how we know that unconscious biases are a thing, um, or at least we assume they are, uh, even though we can't see them, right? We can't measure them directly. Uh, based on something called the Stroop effect, there's online tests you can do to measure your unconscious bias. And this effect is simply, if I give you a bucket full of balls, throw them on the table, and I tell you, grab a ball, and if it's blue, as quickly as you can, put it with the word green. And if it's green, as quickly as you can, put it with the word blue. You will make a bunch of mistakes. And it will be much slower to do this than if I tell you to put green balls with the word green and blue balls with the word blue. There's actually no reason for the difference in your performance of those tasks, other than the fact that we associate that word with things that are green, right? So looking at how many mistakes you make and how quickly you do this kind of a sorting task is one measure of unconscious associations, right? In this case, between a color and a word. Uh, if you want to do some of these tests later, there's a group uh, there's a website called Project Implicit at Harvard. It allows you to do a variety of these tests based on race, um, gender and association with different kinds of re uh, research fields, uh, body weight, um, uh, religiosity, et cetera, disability, lots of them. The task is to associate images and words with categories that are positive or negative and that are consistent with the stereotype or against the stereotype, the opposite of the stereotype. And it measures how quickly you do it, how many mistakes you make, just like with the balls. It gives you a measure of your unconscious association uh, that is consistent or against the stereotype. Um, and so the measurement is basically variation in response speed and error rates. And the way that it does this is uh, multiple attempts. It also has a way to normalize your behavior with something that's not related to stereotypes so that it can actually give you a measure of unconscious associations. The first example of this test that was uh, published is on anti-black implicit or unconscious bias. And what you would get is after you're doing your normalization task to see how slow or fast you are on your computer, um, popping up in the middle 
uh, would be a, an African American or black face, uh, or a white face or a European American in the language of this study. And then you'd have to be sorting either the face with words that were positive or negative. And so the against stereotype condition is a sorting black people and positive things together. The uh, against stereotype condition is, or sorry, then white people with things that are negative. And then the stereotype condition is sorting white people with things that are positive and black people with things that are negative. And we can talk about the history of enslavement and why this is a stereotype, but I'm not going to do that. I'm happy to talk about it if you want to. So the, you get a measure then of either you have a strong implicit bias in favor of blackness, if it's way easier for you to sort blackness and positive things, or a strong implicit bias for whiteness, if it's easier for you to associate positive things with whiteness. And so this has been online for quite some time, um, and more than 3 million scores over this period, and more since then, have shown that about 18% of people fall in the middle of the scale with no bias. But the majority of people who have taken this test online from countries all over the world fall on the right side. A moderate to strong implicit bias for which they see positive things associated with whiteness and negative things with blackness. And the reason I first started doing this work is that back in 2010, I took this test. And having grown up in suburban Vancouver, where my brothers and I were usually the only black children in our neighborhood and in our school, I have apparently internalized the stereotypes about black people. And when I did this test, I ended up with a moderate to strong implicit bias in favor of seeing positive things with whiteness. I spent three weeks in the literature trying to debunk the test, because <laughs> that's what you do. This can't possibly be true. I've taken it three or four times since then, over the years. It always ends up here. I don't think you can change your biases, but I think you can be aware they're there. And after I've had this result, not only did I start doing this work, so I'm like, I, if I can have a bias against black people with my black you know, children and all the rest, then anyone can. And what I did was actually go back at all my letters of recommendation for black students and look through them to make sure I didn't have any of some of the patterns I'll show you later. Um, I'm very conscious that this is a possibility all the time. And that's really what this is about. It's about awareness. In the old days, I'd show that result and I would cry. Like it's, I can't describe it. Anyway, just to show you that there are studies of how these things look over time. Humans aren't terrible people. We are gradually becoming more aware of these patterns. And explicit bias is decreasing over time in most societies. Although in the States, it seems to be popping back up again. Um, and uh, implicit bias is changing along with it. Because of course, as explicit bias decreases, our media changes, our stereotypes, you know, hopefully reduce, etc. And so what this graph shows you is, on the left, anti-gay and lesbian implicit bias, one of the tests um, online. And on the right, anti-black implicit bias. And this is a, the dark, the black line is the actual data over time, um, starting in 2008 until about 2016. And then the rest of it is a model estimating how that's going to look over time. So the good news is that these are going down, some at a faster rate than others. Um, there's a body weight bias, and it's pretty much flat. So some of them aren't changing, unfortunately. But what you can see is the time to reach neutral is a minimum of 57 years for anti-black bias, and a minimum uh, uh, between 9 and 29 years for anti-gay uh, bias, essentially. So in other words, we can't wait, right? I mean, maybe you can wait if this isn't affecting you, but uh, hopefully if you're thinking about human rights, we can't wait for bias to disappear. It's going to be a long time. Again, I'd like to emphasize that this is not just some magical thing that only attaches itself to marginalized groups. There's any number of traits of people in the statistical majority that might twig a bias in your senior colleagues, right? Um, and so that might be various traits like the ones you see here, it might not be. The difference is, it might or it might not. Some people have biases against certain traits, some don't, but there's no consistent overall negative um, association that reliably you'll interact with if you're in the statistically dominant order. It varies. In comparison, there are strong, consistent effects that point in the same direction, the same negative direction, for people in marginalized groups. Anti-black bias pretty much always looks the same. Um, misogyny pretty much always looks the same, and when that becomes unconscious, it has a similar direction. And so that means that you can have strong cumulative effects because these stereotypes are so pervasive. But if we figure out ways to make sure people are conscious of their biases and how it affects decision making, it can also benefit people in the statistically dominant group who may have traits, as I said, 
that don't align with what people expect. Um, and again, to take away the, the race and gender, I like to show this example. This is from a book called Blink by Malcolm Gladwell several years ago. He actually pulled up data on the average height of American men and the average height of Fortune 500 CEOs, so top leaders, and there's a significant difference. And what he argued was, this isn't saying that the men who are six foot tall are bad leaders. It is saying that there's probably men who are 5'9", who would have been perfectly fine as leaders or great as leaders. But over the course of their career, we know that it, psychology says we ascribe leadership qualities to height. I pick up my afro when I give a talk and I often wear high heels so it wasn't so hot outside. <laughs> I totally use this stereotype, right? Um, but it's true. And so the data show over and over again in most cultures, taller means people just automatically think you have more you know, uh, gravitas. And so over the course of a career, small advantages from height in leadership can lead to this statistically significant difference at the level of populations. And that's the kind of thing we're talking about. So the small biases can accumulate into significant underrepresentation. Again, I'm going to show you the examples of how it manifests, but I just want to show you this overall uh, simulation model. So if you start off with a, well, an organization that has 53% women at entry level, and then you create a simulation model that says, okay, let's assume there are eight levels of seniority in this organization. And at each level, you draw a performance score from a normal distribution, but then you give men a 1% advantage, 1%, and you go through eight levels of seniority. This is what you get, 35% in leadership compared to 53% at entry level. And that's just 1%, right, in eight discrete steps. So if you think about how this works over the course of a career, every opportunity where people can be assessing you or giving you an opportunity or denying you an opportunity, the result can be quite substantive. So here's the tag, we're finally getting into the case studies. Here's some examples. Um, and this is an example from the literature where they actually constructed an email that they sent to professors um, at universities across the United States. And they said, uh, the, the email says, dear professor, I'm going to be on campus. I really love your research. I'd like to work with you as a PhD student. Do you have time to meet with me? Identical emails where they simulated different genders and races, binary gender, because that's what they did, um, using these names, which most people interpret as being from one group or the other. I'm using their language, so Hispanic is the language they use. On other slides, there'll be a, a category Latinx. I'm just using the language of their studies. I asked Lucianne, like, what word should they use? But anyway, so I'm just going to default to that. And so they filled in these names. So what I'm going to show you is the response rate for professors who get this cold call email out of the blue. First of all, 67% uh, of them responded, which to me is astounding, because like I have three week old emails I haven't looked at yet. Um, and then this is the field they're in. In the brackets is the overall response rate from that field. It's kind of interesting that that varies too. If you're engineering, you're just like, eh, leave me alone. Um, and what I'm going to show you is the size of the discriminatory gap between a response to white men and every other group in the sample. In the end, they, they lumped them because that's where the difference lived. Starting from business, a 20% advantage for white men in terms of responses, um, down to sciences and math at 5%. Social sciences and humanities were about equal. There's no significant difference there. And fine arts was the only group in which they actually discriminated against white men. But the point is that in almost every case, there is a bias in response, even if it's the opposite of what we expected. And in some cases, it's quite strong. A 10% difference in one email multiplied by the number of different professors you might be writing for to asking for a PhD position. Think about how that works in your life, right? So this gap is substantive. And it's not just in these kinds of simulations. There's a whole series of things we call the resume studies, um, where they do something similar. They have a similar resume for an entry-level position in an organization. Um, this is true across many different countries. There's a, there's a meta-analysis I can share that shows a bunch of different countries. And in every case, there's a disadvantage for people in, in these other groups. Here's an example that's closer to home. Um, and this is uh, a, a simulation or a study in which they created CVs, identical CVs, that they sent out to professors. Again, it was across the United States. And they had, were in biology or physics. And they said, review the uh, competence and hireability of the people whose CVs you're reading. 
And then again, they simulated gender and apparent race uh, with names. Um, and this is what they found. So with respect to whether people thought it was a woman or a man uh, with that particular record, no difference in biology, yay. <laughs> but the physicists judged women as being less competent with the same CV. With respect to race, biology starts showing some problems. So if people thought that the person writing was black, a decrease in competence measurements in physics, um, that was true for both people who they thought were black or Latinx. So this um, is not just problematic for the person applying. This is problematic if you think you're hiring the best people out of the pool that you have av available to you, right? So this is the business case as well. Eaton et al. 2019. <laughs> Here's another example that I forgot to animate on. <laughs> Student evaluations of teaching. So you get in, let's say you're teaching. I know not everyone has to teach, or I shouldn't say gets to teach. Not everyone gets to teach. <laughs> um, and so this is a study in which they had undergraduates, more than 1,000 of them, um, split between men and women. So again, it's, you're not protected from having biases just because you're in the same group. And they had men and women instructors at five different universities teaching, teaching basically the same entry-level course. It's in economics, but economics is a very quantitative field, so this is quantitative economics. And what they did was ask them, they gave them a student evaluation on basically the start of the course, day two, and then again after their midterm. On day two, after you've basically presented the syllabus, which is the same across all these courses, women are rated as less knowledgeable than men on day two. After the midterm, women suffer more of a penalty in terms of, they, you know, men actually kind of, they both go up, which is interesting. I guess the midterm was hard, but the gap increases in student evaluation of your knowledge. If you ask whether they're interesting, again, right from the get-go, day two, women are considered to be less interesting, and they become even less interesting after the midterm. So these kinds of patterns repeat themselves over and over again in things that are used, at least in some contexts, to evaluate you for promotion, to evaluate your performance reviews. Another example, this one is evaluating writing competence. And this is an example from law, where uh, memoranda are extensive documents that uh, give information about a particular point of law in a particular case that are used by lawyers to, to make their case in court. And this is one of the things that law students or articling students um, uh, are, are asked to do that are also used to evaluate whether they might get offered a place in the firm. And so what they did was create legal memo with 22 deliberate errors in it, right? So intentionally introducing errors. And then they asked lawyers from across the country, again, different genders, different racialized groups, to assess the writing competence of young attorneys and they also got the biography of the attorney, which was identical, except one was identified as black or African-American, one was identified as white. This is the proportion of errors of the deliberately introduced errors that they found in the document as a function of whether they thought the writer was black or white. They're more likely to find the errors if they thought the writer was black. And so if you uh, look at the comments as well, they were different. So the same document, this person is average at best, can't believe that they graduated from the same school as me. Whereas, ah, basically a good writer, they need to work a little on this, I can mentor them. So it changes how people perceive things. So I want to talk about gender bias and leadership uh, and how that can affect women. So this is um, schema about women in general. So the stereotypes of women um, that are from the media, et cetera, about women and about men and about leaders. So we have stereotypes or beliefs about men or scheme about men, that they are dedicated, determined, assertive, competitive, and independent. We have stereotypes about women. They are helpful, collaborative, sympathetic, kind, dedicated. And then we have stereotypes about leaders. Tall, we can put tall on here too. Um, but the point is that what we expect out of leaders on average from many, many studies in social sciences is overlaps much more closely with what we expect of men. And so what ends up happening is that women um, aren't seen as being leaders. That's the one side. The other side is that if they engage in the behaviors that we expect out of leaders, that is not what we want out of them. 
and they suffer what are called personality penalties. A man behaving one way is treated one way. A woman behaving the same way is treated differently. And I just want to show you um, a video that sort of illustrates that. And the words that you'll see popping up in the video are on the left here in translation. And I hope I have enough volume. I should have asked about that. of how it works. Watching the same behavior can lead to different assumptions about people. And we have data on that that I can show you later, but I just want to show you this one particular example. Um, and so this is an older study, but there's more recent ones I can talk about later. Um, but this is a good one because it is based on acting. And so what they did was ask people to lead a small group towards a decision where the people doing the leading were actors, either men or women. And they had a script for how to move through the decision making and what decisions to what what directions to take depending on what people said. They videotaped the interactions and uh, analyze them later and, and demonstrate that in fact they were substantively similar. And what they did was take the group of people who were making the decisions with this leader and ask them, what are the traits of the leaders that you just interacted with, who we know are actors, men or women? Um, and in terms of their strengths, their ability, skill, and intelligence, men were rated as higher than women. In terms of their warmth and sensitivity, women were rated higher than men. Same script, right? And actors with the same affect, same way of approaching the discussions. In terms of weaknesses, women were seen to be bossy and dominating and too emotional. That's a bizarre one to me. <laughs> um, too emotional even though they were behaving the same way. That's to remind me I've been talking for 45 minutes after which people just start hearing wah, wah. <laughs> um, Right, so again, this idea that actually your perception changes. There are a ton of studies of this kind in literature, and I'm just going to, this is just summarizing a few. I didn't translate this one, um, but I can share the references. Women and people of color are less likely to be judged excellent despite having the same record. We just looked at that. There's an assumption of lower competence or talent right out of the box. We saw that from the student evaluations. There's many other examples. Something I didn't talk about, but it's important if you're involved in recruitment. If you don't decide on the relative importance of your criteria in advance, but look at the resumes first or the CVs first, whichever talents the statistically dominant group have pops up to the top of your criterion list. So not only when you're doing a recruitment should you have a list of criteria, you should rank their relative importance before you read any of the applications. Otherwise, women, people of color are at a disadvantage. And then finally, gender differences in letters of recommendation I'll talk about later. The language used with respect to women is substantively different and is related to those stereotypes about emotional effects. They go into letters of recommendation and reduce estimations of competence. So let's take a break here and ask this question. Has bias, exclusion, or discrimination ever caused you to reconsider um, your course of study or your career plan? So I'm going to move this slide ahead. And again, this is just to, I showed you a bunch of data. Let's see what the room says about their experience. So has bias, exclusion, or discrimination ever caused you to reconsider your course of study um, or your career plans? This is another one of those questions I ask every group um, I talk to. Let's see, big reveal. Right. Again, exactly the same as what I see in every group I talk to. It actually ranges from yes, 30% to yes, 70% in the groups I've talked to in the last several years. So what does this mean? It means I showed you the statistics, but it's real. What I hear a lot from people is, yeah, you know, that's the statistics, but not in my department. I don't do that, not in my lab, not in my institution, not in my city, whatever, right? It's, it's always displacing it from yourself because none of us want to work in an organization that is 
resulting in that kind of disadvantage for some people, right? Most of us want to be working in a fair, equitable organization. But the reality is that the people sitting next to you, 50% of the people in the room, roughly, have had these kinds of issues actually make them think about leaving, right? Let that sink in. Nothing to do with their talent, nothing to do even with their training or their ability. It is the constant erosion of your self-esteem by people just never expecting you to be as good as you need to be or not seeing that you are good. So I'd like to um, make sure people recognize that it's not just the numbers. I'm going to end with this before we have a break. There are now studies that show it is harder to acknowledge these things are happening if you're in the statistically dominant group. So this was a study in which they showed um, uh, men and women in the social sciences or in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, medicine, um, a study in which gender bias had been demonstrated like the kind of experimental work I showed you earlier. And they asked them, how uh, good is this study? Do you trust the results? And then they manipulated the abstract to say it had shown the opposite, that there was no gender bias in these fields. Men and women in the social sciences rated both of those abstracts equally, equally um, convincing. Men and women in the sciences diverged. If it showed no gender bias, men in the sciences rated it as more convincing than if it showed gender bias, whereas women rated them the same. So understandably, if you've gone through your career and not experienced any of these things, if you're in the no category in that previous graph, it is hard to see that they're happening, right? They haven't happened to you. You maybe don't recognize them when you see it happening to people around you. So it's just a red flag that your personal experience actually can't be centered in these conversations because not everyone has the same personal experience. So I think at that point, ah uh, yes, which is what is illustrated here. I'll just say one more thing and then we'll have questions and answers. So the person on the left has things they need to accomplish to get to the finish line, right? Whatever your finish line is, you know, being a top researcher, having a big grant, whatever. They're, they're jumping over hurdles for sure. The point is the person on the right, no matter what they do, cannot bring down these hurdles. These Theirs are barriers, not hurdles. It's not how much they learn or how good they are, or how much how hard they work. It's something that's welded to their skin and their identity. And so if the person on the left doesn't see that this is an issue, it makes it really hard for the person on the right to, to, to be sustained in their efforts. And so that's kind of, I think, where I want to leave you. And I'm happy to take questions or comments on this part of the presentation. Take a break. <laughs>